I'd like to begin first with a reading from Whispers from Eternity. This is a poem by Master entitled, The Bee of My Mind Loves to Drink from Thy Blue Lotus Feet. O Divine Mother, the bee of my mind is ever engrossed in thy lotus feet of blue light. It drinks the honey of thy motherly love. This bee will drink no other honey but that which is graced by thy perfume sweetness. O Divine Mother, flying over the gardens of my fancy, denying myself the honey of lesser pleasures, I have found at last the ambrosia buried in thy lotus heart. I have been thy busy bee. I have soared through the fields of many incarnations, breathing the airs of countless experiences. I will roam now no more. Thy fragrance has quenched at last the perfume thirst of my soul. And this is from Rays of the One Light, which are parallel commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita. This week's reading is entitled, Intuition is Simple, the Intellect is Complex. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. In the Gospel of St. Mark, we read a passage that Yogananda often quoted. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. It has often been noted that a critical attitude tends to paralyze creativity. Good critics, for example, seldom produce works of creative genius, though their creations may be intellectually clever. The intellect separates. It analyzes, then puts things together again piece by piece. Intellect lacks intuition's flow, which descends smoothly, like a river from the superconscious. Paramhansa Yogananda described intuition as the soul's power of knowing God. To receive the kingdom of God, Jesus was saying, one must do so with the openness and trust of a little child. Intellectuals may object to this statement, saying, but there must also be discrimination. You wouldn't want a person to be so open-minded that his brain falls out. The truth is, however, that the intellect can be fooled, even when it does its best to discriminate wisely. Only intuition is capable of penetrating to the heart of a matter and knowing the truth, sorry, knowing truth from falsehood. It was the clear understanding of a child, not the elaborately persuaded intellects of his elders, that enabled the child in Hans Christian Andersen's story to cry out in surprise, why isn't the emperor wearing any clothes? Therefore it was that Sri Krishna said in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, To you who are free from the carping spirit, I shall now reveal wisdom sublime. Grasping it with your mind and perceiving it by intuitive realization, you shall escape the evils of delusion. Thus through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. This is really one of the age-old topics, the intellect versus the intuition. And whereas um, reason and feeling have to be balanced in our natures, and we may have a nature that is more strongly rational or more strongly feeling, and these do have to be balanced. Uh, at the same time, intuition in, and reason 
do not have to be balanced in the same way. Reason has to be guided by intuition. Intuition has to be double-checked by reason. But of the two, intuition is more powerful. Intuition is the power of the soul, whereas reason is a power of the mind. Another way to think of it is that we have the subconscious, conscious, and superconscious levels of our awareness. And the tool of the, and reason is the tool of the conscious mind. Again, it analyzes, separates, and then puts back together. Analyze, that word lice means to cut. I think that, and ana maybe means to separate, I forget. Anyway, in any case, I think that's right, because like enzymes, they, they cut, and they have that same word. Anyway, cut. It's definitely cut. And so, um, so we can be so thrilled with our power of analysis, but you just try to analyze uh, a poem, a song, for example, and if you cut it all to pieces after a point, it's sort of, you've killed the soul of it. And if you try to analyze a, a friend too much, you may do the same thing. And so when, but at the same time, intuition is the power of the superconscious mind. So conscious reason, superconscious, intuition. And if you're wondering what about subconscious, the subconscious's power is habit. That's something we don't think consciously of, we can do automatically um, as we practice it. I was teaching uh, some of the students a new technique yesterday, and I was assuring them that they would start to get into the habit of doing it. And I got some very suspicious looks, like, not this thing, this is way too hard. You didn't tell us in level one that we would have to be doing this later on. But in time, even in the course of that class, they found that it became easier and easier as they got used to it, because the body started to just remember, okay, this is what you want me to do, all right, I'll do it in this way. Isn't that true? Yeah, okay. See, we have one. Uh, person affirming that I'm telling the truth. Now, um, so we have to remember that it, even though, yes, reason and feeling have to be balanced, and I don't mean they have to be balanced equally. If ours is a more feeling nature, we should be sure to include some reason. And if ours is a more rational nature, we should include some feeling. It, but it isn't that we all have to become 50-50 in that sense. On the other hand, maybe it is true. In uh, one of the vows that Swami Kriyananda wrote for the renunciate order, he, it says, it's interesting because it also refers to this natural state um, and, and ability of men and women, that women tend to be more strongly feeling-oriented and men tend to be more strongly uh, reason-oriented. Of course, it doesn't mean that each doesn't have the other uh, ability, of course they do, but there's that sort of tendency and strength, and then that strength becomes amplified when the other power is brought in. So reason becomes rightly guided only by feeling, and feeling is held in a state of clarity, you could say, by reason, by just double-checking and so on, because too much reason and the heart is just empty. In fact, you can make very cruel decisions, heartless decisions, just based on reason. These are the facts. This is the law. It was broken. You go to jail. Swamiji would love to tell this story of a man who came before a judge, and the judge says, how do you plead? You know, meaning guilty or not guilty. Guilty. And the man said, your honor, I plead for mercy. <laughs> you know, that's how we are before God. God says you have... Yet Heavenly Father says, you have broke the karmic law. You have gone against it. This is the punishment. And we say, okay, yes, sir. And then we say, uh, Amma, you know, can you talk to him? You know, the father sends you to bed and says, no dinner. And the mother says, absolutely not, no dinner. Just take a few idlis and dosa with you. <laughs> but other than that, no dinner. And so we have this sort of uh, appealing to the feeling. And I have to say that um, Master and Swamiji both said, uh, truthfully, of the two, uh, even feeling is higher than reason because of its alignment with intuition. Both can be brought to an intuitive awareness. And again, we have both in us. We don't want to be thinking, oh, I have this one or I, and I don't have the other. We have both. However, um, as I was saying in that vow, uh, it says, it, for the renunciate order, it says, um, uh, 
I will never take a partner, or if I am married, I will see my partner as belonging only to thee, Lord. In any case, I am complete in myself, and in myself will merge all the opposites of duality. So this is broader than just reason and, fe and feeling. It's all the opposites of duality. But Swamiji and Master both pointed out how men and women it's instinctively are attracted to each other partly because of or primarily because they each sense that the other has a strength to give them. That, that, that's part of the attraction, the balance of, of feeling and reason. I don't want to get too much on this theme because, as I said, we're all both. We have both. So don't get too caught up in, okay, I'm this way, I'm that way, nothing like that. The point is, in myself, I will merge both of these. And because God has all of this, and so that's where we're going. So, having said that, now we can feel uh, very deeply and very strongly about something, but we can also be blinded by desire. And so when we feel too strongly, and then someone says, let's just check a few facts. No need to check facts. I feel it. Must be so. Then we have to say, wait, 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 wait. Just take a moment, take a breath, because truth, as Master said, is not afraid of questions. Truth is not afraid of questions. So if we feel this is the truth and someone questions it or we need to research it, we should be willing. We should say if it's true, it should stand up to scrutiny. And furthermore, um, I should not hesitate to double check it. Now, sometimes an intuitive truth is so far clearly the answer beyond the steps of reason that uh, it isn't easy to verify at first. Even Einstein, you know, who the, the, the sort of rationalists hold up as one of the greatest scientists of, the, of his time and rightly deserved. I mean, even in Gorgon, there was a picture advertising some home tuition place for children. And they had a, like a five-year-old or a four-year-old boy smiling. And he had a gray wig on and a mustache that looked exactly like Einstein you know, a four-year-old Indian boy version of Einstein, so not exactly, but still. It was like, see, this is what your child can become if he takes our tuition. Why start them at four, I wonder? Why not start them at two or one, you know? <laughs> it's ridiculous. I asked someone, how's your child having exam? You know, everything is either studying for an exam, taking an exam, recovering from an exam, and that's it. <laughs> but that's the whole cycle. So, um, the, so truth is not afraid of questions. On the other hand, if we have a rational thought, then we have to uh, hold up to the feeling quality of it. This may be clear and right and true, but does it feel right? And Swamiji would often go by, would always go by intuition, but he said often people would try to convince him of a certain plan with all kinds of good reasons, but if he didn't feel intuitively, that it was the right thing, he would not accept their reasons. He wouldn't necessarily say, no, no, never, because I don't feel it, because he might feel it later. He might say, well, we're going to need to do more research. We need, we need more. It's not clear yet. But he said sometimes people would get very frustrated because they'd stated it all clearly. And so why didn't he just say yes? We have to understand that reason can be fooled. In a way, you could say feeling can be blinded by attachment, by desire, I want it to be this, I feel that it is this, it must be this, that's too much. We should always be a little bit, take one step back and, and hold it up to the truth, to say, God, is this what you want? Even if it's true, even if I'm fully justified in this course of action, is it what you want? Is now the right time? That's another way you can talk yourself out of detachment, attachment. At least it's something that's worked for me. This may be completely right, but is it the right time? <sighs> hmm. Because then you're not saying, no, it's not right, because then, yes, it is right, you know, instinctively. This can be a battle and argument we have within ourselves. I don't mean that necessarily it's something we're having with somebody else. And so finding a way, if, we, if we're too attached, we can't just say, don't be attached. That's taking it head on. We have to find ways around it. So is it the right time, for example? Is this the right place? Is this the right person, I should ask even? Finding some way to double check. 
And in that, to say, listen, even if I'm right, I don't want to do the right thing at the wrong time. You see? And so let me just hold on a minute. And the greater the urgency, the greater the need for caution. Swamiji said once in, uh, in a talk, I have found that if I have, whenever I have made a decision under unduly influenced by intense emotion, it has always been wrong. You see, and I have found the exact same thing. This is the motivation. Forget everything I've said, but take note. Keep a little logbook. Intense emotion, decision, disaster. Hmm, okay. <laughs> Next day, intense emotion, decision, in aura disaster. <laughs> and so then after a while, you start to see a correlation <laughs> that, you know, intense emotion, pause, Add two drops, self-control. What is self-control? That's it. Just close the mouth for a moment, even if... But until you, if you haven't fired the gun, you're okay. Once the toothpaste is out of the tube, that's it. But before, you're in good shape. Nobody knows. You can even sit here kind of with a great looking, you know, smile on your face. No one knows what's going on under the hood, under the bonnet. And so, in this way, it's, it's interesting when you, be a, it's a good experience for someone when people change seats because you kind of, you know, you have a whole road map and then you sort of have to adjust it. So, okay, very good. Keeping me on my toes. So, um, we have self-control. If we take a moment, that urgency that we feel, don't trust it. And it, may, it masquerades as, no, 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 I feel it deeply and calmly. I'm very calm. <laughs> because we know as yogis how to fake it. We know what we're supposed to say, so we'll say it. But it's not true. You know inside whether you're calm. The easiest way is if someone says, wait, whether you can say, fine. If we can say, fine. Even to ourselves, we say, wait. Okay, <laughs> fine. But you realize that, again, that urgency that Ma Swamiji once said to be impulsive, to act on impulse, is one of the worst things on the spiritual path. Not the worst in terms of worst sin, but in terms of worst mistake, because we just create unnecessary mess. Remember, his Master said of that one disciple who left the monastery, he said if she had just remained here 24 hours longer, she would have been freed from this karma forever. I mean, 24 hours longer and then forever. I mean, what a thought. It's just like, just say to someone, hide my car keys, you know, take my phone, delete the Ola app, you know, don't let me leave. You know, just no matter what I say, wait till 24 hours from now. You know, just so we have to do that with ourselves. That's self-control. Now, who knows? Maybe she came back onto the path and then she had to wait 48 hours longer and then she was freed forever. Who knows? But the point is, even that narrow window of time can make all the difference. And someone gave me this advice once and I appreciated it. When I was trying to decide on a, which graduate school to go to, he said, make your, because I was having a hard time deciding. I mean, I was fortunate to have any choices at all. But um, he said, Make your decision, but don't send in the form yet, you know, to, to fully accept it, because I had time. Make your decision and then wait a week we, and sit with your decision and see how it feels. And it was funny because I made my decision and then in that week I kept getting messages, literally emails, <laughs> from the other, the other choice. And the ones, the place I had decided to go, it was all kind of blocked energy. And so I, at the end of that week, I changed my decision. But it was so hard to make a decision at first because I felt like it was final. And he was saying, don't make it final. Decide and then give yourself a week. It's very helpful when trying to take a job, you know, any kind of thing where, where reason isn't getting you all the way. Make any decision. He didn't say don't decide for a week because that's paralyzing too. Sometimes it's better when you can't make a decision, to just pick one and go forward because it gets the energy moving. Especially if you can do so in a way that allows you to then change you know, direction if you have to. In other words, I was committed in my mind but not fully committed yet. 
And so if we can do the same thing, just start going off in any direction rather than just being paralyzed. As Swamiji said, reason can paralyze. One person put it as analysis is paralysis. If we think too much, we can just get caught up because reason can be guided wrongly. Reason doesn't like to think so, partly because we live in the scientific age. We've seen all these great uh, things come about because of logic, because of science, and so, which is all true. And um, speaking of science, I never finished the Einstein thing. I got so caught up on that four-year-old boy that, you know, I forgot about it. The point of Einstein, I forgot to say, was that he said E equals MC squared, and we all say yes, not quite sure what it means, but everybody says it's something big, and so we'll say yes, it's big. But he arrived at that inspiration through not logic, not reason, but intuition. He saw it in a flash. And then it took him 10 years to try to explain it in a way that connected existing science and mathematics to what he saw was true. So he, if he had just run around saying E equals MC squared, people would say, oh, yeah, yeah, and they would just walk on. They wouldn't even know what he's talking about. And he would have just been, in science, they basically would call him a crackpot that have all these amazing theories, but don't do any kind of sort of solid research to justify them. But if he had just sat in his lab going <laughs> like this, working with all the existing things, he could never have built a bridge to this flash of inspiration. And so, and it, he was a rare soul who had the inspiration, the intuition, but also took the trouble to explain it. And there's a poster that often you'll see in classrooms, especially math classrooms. It's a quote from Einstein saying, never mind your troubles with mathematics. I assure you, mine are much greater. He would often talk about how he struggled with math. It's because he was having to create new math to do things. But anyway, never mind. Still, it's a thought that counts. And so we want to understand that all great things come from intuition. All great things really do come from feeling. Now, why can reason be guided wrongly? Because reason can only proceed from, you know, step one to step two. Because of that's true, then from step two to step three. It's a whole chain, right, of logic that each, because each thing is true, we can continue on. This is making sense, rational argument. But the problem is there has to be a step zero, or there has to be a step one that does not depend on anything, right? I mean, if there's a whole long chain, it has to start somewhere. And so that first step we just have to accept as true, so that then we can continue on. But is it true or not? Reason can't say. Because if it said it's because of true because of this, well, then it's not step one. The thing that came before it that you're using as the justification is step one. And so a common example of this, which I'm sure you encounter every day, is Euclidean geometry. And uh, I'm joking. And so um, <laughs> in Euclidean geometry, he starts with certain definitions, certain axioms, which are just statements, and certain postulates, which are just that th we have to take these as true. Because again, you have to start somewhere. Now what's interesting about that is he says, like, for example, two lines, when they meet, they, they meet at a point. And you sort of, you know, ch -ch -ch, yeah, it looks like that. Okay, I agree. You know, why? You just draw a picture. See, it looks like it. You know, we, beyond, well, but why? I don't know. It just is that way. So fine. So we say they meet at a, we, they meet at a point. But we have all kinds of things we can do with straight lines, and they'll always meet at a point unless they're going in the same direction. Right? See, like this, but otherwise, same direction. And so he uh, has this postulate that if I don't rem I should have looked it up before I came here, but I didn't even know I was going to mention it. Do you remember the parallel postulate? Does anyone remember the wording of it? It's not obvious that two parallel lines never meet. That's the point of it. But that's not a postulate. That's a definition. There's something about, essentially, if they're going in the same direction, then they will never intersect. And it bothered Euclid that why should he have to say 
this is true because I declare it to be true. Somehow it should be able to be proven. I mean, you know, they're, they're not intersecting at a point and there's sort of, there's a hope you can say there's perpendiculars. You should be able to somehow prove this as a theorem, meaning base it on other things. Because the more your postulates, sort of the, the less good things are. You want to have as few things that we have to accept without explanation. We want that number to be very small. And so he tried to eliminate this parallel postulate, and he couldn't. And so then later on, mathematicians came, don't worry, the math part is almost over. <laughs> the mathematicians came along and they said, suppose that parallel lines do meet. They don't meet right away, because then they're, they're, not, they're obviously not parallel, but let's just say ad infinity, whatever that means, that they somehow meet there. And now, if you think about it, this actually could make sense. If you look at a uh, sphere or you look at the Earth, uh, a globe, you know, remember when we used to have globes before Wikipedia and anima animations and things like that, Google Earth? We had physical balls that showed you the Earth and so on. And so they, they had the grid lines, right, the latitude lines or the longitude lines. But you think, especially with longitude, it might be a little easier to see that they sort of they go like this, but then they kind of, you sort of think of them as parallel, but they're not. They all meet at the North Pole and the South Pole. And so even though they seem parallel when you look up close, when you take it from afar, they meet at the top and the bottom. So it isn't totally weird. In fact, this kind of geometry that says parallel lines meet is called spherical geometry. It's understandable because of this. It's, our, it's familiar to us. In fact, if you look carefully at human vision, it is spherical too. Why? Well, guess what? What shape is the eye? It's also spherical. You know, you, the, even the part that we see with it still has a slight curve. So we perceive things actually with this curvature. We can't help it. So this is, this again, this is how reason is guided perhaps wrongly because in this case parallel lines don't meet, but what if they do? You see, we ha so that's where reason can be wrong on its first assumptions. On step one, we can be wrong. And so if we're too rational in our nature, we should keep this in mind. Let me question my first principles. Maybe they're wrong. Now, you might say in all of this that, well, we're talking about reason versus feeling, but there's been, first of all, feeling is, is higher, right? But there's been talk of Einstein and Euclidean <laughs> geometry and all this logic. Like, this all seems very rational. I am proving logically that reason is less than feeling. It doesn't make any sense, really. And I was aware of that. I anticipated that question. You see, how do we get out of it? It's very simple. We just, the more joy we feel, the more it takes away everything. It takes away doubt, it takes away criticism, it takes away um, the need to arrive at everything logically first, then I will believe, because you do believe because of how you feel. This is one of the things that's most frustrating about uh, sharing spiritual teachings, is the most important thing, which is that feeling of joy in the heart. It's impossible to teach. We sort of do everything we can. It's sort of like you could say having a restaurant and you make the food and you make the environment so beautiful and nice and you have all these things, you have a discount and all kinds of things to try to attract people and help them. But you, you can f serve them the food. You could even put, them in the, put the food in their mouths, but you can't make them taste it. If they, meaning if they have a cold or something like that and they can't taste, then they can't taste it. There's nothing you can do about it. It's the same thing with the spiritual path. We have to taste that joy ourselves. That's why sometimes devotees can seem so irrational because they're guided by that joy. And if you haven't tasted it, it just seems, why would you do all this? You know, why... As one person was saying, why would you come on Sunday morning and then stay for so long? Some people stay until even 10 o'clock at night here at the center. I mean, besides two people, the two of us, the, sometimes there are others. And so it's why it doesn't, you know, I mean, you have a Sunday, you have so many things, there's so much on TV you're missing. And, uh, but that taste, there's more joy in it, so I do it. That's easy to understand. 
But to taste that joy is not easy for everybody. It's potentially easy as we become uncomplicated. Remember, the intellect is complex, but intuition is simple. And so, as that is one thing Master said, meditate on God for his joy, which was our affirmation. Seek that joy. Find those things on the spiritual path that make you feel good and do those things. That will balance out the other things. Discipline is required. Willpower is required. Strength is required. Fine. But those come into play easily when you know what the point is. I felt joy and I want to feel more. I had a difficult time and I remained calm. And I liked that. And so I want more of that. You see, build your taste for it rather than worrying too much about your mind and all the reasons and so on. Reason, it's wonderful in this movie about Padre Pio, who was a great Italian saint. He said, the devil is very clever. And he goes like this. And I don't know what this means in Italian, but I do know. Universally, in all language, it's just exactly. Same thing for reason. Very tricky, very crafty. It can easily confuse us. It can easily trip us up. So this is when we are trying to guide ourselves just by reason alone. So what's one solution? Just chant. Because chant, in chanting we get out of the mind, we get more into the heart and so on. Listen to the talks of the masters because they, Swamiji and Master, primarily when we listen to them, it lifts our mind above everything. That's another simple thing. How do you reason feeling and 6% reason and 29% feeling and no, no, no. Just follow the guru because when you're with him, you can't go wrong. And he will you listening to him, feeling his presence, you get that sense of okay, it you automatically are guided rightly. I shouldn't say automatically, but you're encouraged because you feel this makes perfect sense and mm, it may not work. It may not be right. And so similarly, this doesn't make any sense at all, and yet for some reason I'm feeling to do it. So we have to double check. But um, the other thing I wanted to mention in this regard was that when we, are, um, when we are not feeling anything, then that we have to remember that the lack of feeling, the absence of feeling, I'm sorry, dullness or lack of feeling, I don't feel anything, is not absence of feeling, it is trapped feeling. You see, it is our natural state to feel. And so if we feel numb, that's the word I was looking for. Numbness is not the absence of feeling. It is trapped feeling. So when we feel numb, it's not because, well, I, I don't have any feeling. That's why I feel numb. No problem. It's that, no, we are suppressing something. We are blocking the flow of feeling. Maybe for good reason. Maybe we're in an emergency situation, and if we felt how we truly feel about it, we would just dissolve into a puddle. But we have to be strong warriors and soldiers, so we have to march on. Never mind that, let me get through this emergency. That's fine for a while. But we can't go on and on and on like that. When we do that, we are choking the heart, we are choking the flow of energy in the spine, and so just a little bit is getting through compared to our normal capacity. And it, we can't sustain ourselves that long, or even if we can, it's not worth it, because just when the face looks like this for too long, then we have to do something. Read a funny story. You know, watch it. There's a ridiculous video about what if Batman was from Chennai. I leave it to you <laughs> to answer that question. Yeah, so I mean, silly, just useless things, just to lighten up. And, and there's two simple ways to get out of numbness, I mean, sorry, two easy ways. One is humor, and the other is uh, gratitude. If you start to think of things that you're grateful for, that starts to open the heart again. And we may then feel that pain that we have been putting to the side. But when you feel that pain again, people have this in meditation sometimes. They start to meditate, and then feelings of upset start to come up. But those are coming up for release. They've been there the whole time, and they're basically weighing us down, or they're hurting the heart. It's already there. So this is an attempt to heal. This is a, an attempt to basically, as I said, release. 
So go with that flow as long as you can. Try not to get swept away in it. Yeah, life is rotten and these people were terrible and I don't even know why I should bother. You know, that, that's going a little too far. Just say, Divine Mother, help me. Help me to understand or help me to pray for them or I can't pray for them, but you pray for them. You know, this kind of thing. Find a way to open the heart again. So, um, the last thing I wanted to mention is about this carping spirit. It's wonderful, that word carping spirit that Krishna uses, is that, that being too critical. There's a funny thing about criti being critical is that, that people who are critical tend then not to be creative. And that's what you see about these great critics, as, as Swami said, they're very good at giving advice or pointing out what things are wrong, but they're not so good at doing the creative things themselves. There was an interesting study Swamiji referred to of uh, a collection of sort of, um, there was a, at a one college there was a men's sort of writing club for the students and a women's writing club. This was, you know, many decades ago. And the, what they saw was that the, um, the men, all who were in that writing group, all had some talent as students, but none of them were writers when they grew up. And the uh, women, many of them were. It became well-known or published or became journal journalists or authors or so on. And so they, they, that's the punchline, but they went back to see, now how were they as students, and I don't know how they figured all this out, but they did. Maybe they just interviewed them. What the men did in their writing group was attempt to find all the flaws in each other's work. And so when somebody would read something, the others would do the best they could to tear it apart in the name of scholarly integrity or whatever, you know, uh, garbage justification they were giving. And then the women tended to encourage each other. And it's not, again, a question of men and women, but this is how it was. They tended to be supportive. I really liked when you said this. I really related to it. They found different ways, perhaps even in offering a correction or a suggestion, to do so in an, with an encouraging attitude. And so then you see the punchline of what the results were. So we have to, again, don't worry so much about, yes, well, could you please tell this person in my life because they could really stand to hear this advice. No. <laughs> Think about it in ourselves. We have some parts, some voices that encourage us and some that discourage. We have some parts that are too critical, especially self-critical, perhaps, and others that are kinder. So one, one way I was uh, thinking of it when I was too self-critical about something, I thought, my gosh, listen to the kind of things I'm saying. I would never say this to a friend of mine who had the exact same problem. I would say, well, hang in there, you'll be all right, you know, come on, let's go for a walk. I wouldn't say, you know, it's actually worse than you think, because you forgot these things too. Yeah, kashtam, pavam, terrible. <laughs> I would not say that. And so, but why am I saying it to myself then? You see? So find, f deal with the citizens of your own mind and say, even if this one is so loud-mouthed, is it actually speaking truth? So, speaking again about creativity versus criticism, uh, Swamiji had a uh, project he was working on with somebody, and every time he was proposing different ideas, she kept criticizing it. She said, no, the problem is with this, the problem with that. No, 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 it wouldn't work this way, and so on. And it went on and on. He was basically, I think he was writing a script for a slideshow or something. I'm not sure. But so she kept finding problems and putting up objections. And he said to her, if you object one more time, I'm not going to be able to finish this project. Because all of these uh, rational, well-thought-out criticisms are stopping the flow of creativity and inspiration. And she said, okay, Swamiji. And the next thing he brought up, or soon after, she said, ah, but the problem is, and he said, that's it. And he put the project down, and as far as I know, he didn't complete it after that. He might have later, I'm not sure. But the point was, it's just impossible to get through. So again, the dialogue in your own head. If you're trying to come up with a solution and part of you saying, well, but see, first of all, there's, no, don't just, just say, 
we'll think about it later, we'll analyze it later, but let me just be in the world of potential, in the intuitive flow, and not get caught up in all these justifications and, and problems yet. But the other thing that's very interesting is that um, I, it's, it's funny because it was a thought that uh, came from astrology of all places. Now astrology, the whole purpose of it is to study people. And Swamiji had read that the ancient yogic texts have said that you can't fully understand yoga unless you also understand astrology. And this has partly to do with the planets being related to the chakras and the inner zodiac and Kriya Yoga and all that. You can read it in Autobiography of a Yogi. But he said as he read the texts on astrology, he found that astrologers were not overburdened with wisdom. Not having too much insight into human nature. It's such a temptation of the rational mind to put things in categories, 12 categories, for example, and then just hold to those categories and logic, forgetting that these are human beings that we're talking about and very complex people. Even if you can read people who were born on the exact same day in the exact same city, meaning same time, everything, identical charts, there's no chart for the soul. Identical twins, for example, or even non-identical twins, but twins born at the same time, or close to the same time. I, you know, <laughs> forgive me, the doctors in the audience, no, not the same time, yes, okay. <laughs> so um, that, that there will be very similar karma, seemingly, but the soul makes everything different. You can't read that. So in any case, but nevertheless, with that caveat and that warning, um, it said that, Every planet, when, it, when it's elevated, it has this kind of thing. When it uh, is not darkened, it has this kind of thing. So like Saturn, when it's elevated, it's very, it brings great calmness. Remember that the next time you think, Shani, oh, what a problem. No, no, Shani brings Shanti, that's, as people like to say. So Saturn brings calmness. And Dharma, it's the planet of Dharma. It has great spiritual qualities. But when it's out of balance, it's contractive. It's very uh, squeezing us to death, which is really us squeezing ourselves. So, because it's, it, it's one of its qualities is focus. Focus on the truth or focus on everything that's wrong with me. So they go in this way. Mars, when it's doing good, has great creative power and does all kinds of things. When Mars is not doing well, it reaches for the submachine gun and the grenade launcher and all these things and then walks into the kitchen. So, <laughs> we... <laughs> We have to keep the planets in balance. But what's interesting at, that I read about this thing, because I hadn't thought it, it said Venus, of course, when elevated, you know, Venus, if we associate that with the heart, loving, compassionate, nurturing of others, great inner joy also, not just outwardly directed, wonderful. But Venus, when imbalanced, becomes critical. You see, I would have thought hateful or angry or, you know, impulsive, all these things. No, critical. It's the absence of love that makes us very easily critical. And vice versa. If we're too critical, we're not allowing there to be love in our hearts. I said to a friend of mine how someone was teaching a class on how to teach. And the, she was basically saying, it must be this way. Well, what about this? Uh-uh. Well, could we just... It has to be this way, which is to say it has to be my way. And when, because she'd thought about it for many years, she'd been very successful and she had tried all those things and those were, they were substandard, this was the best. And I, I had to admit that I used to think that way myself. And so I had to, you know, acknowledge that, look, I've had that defect in my consciousness too and I don't know in what ways I still think that way. But I had learned that there are many ways to do it right. And, um, but I said this to a friend of mine, and he said, well, but that attitude of uh, criticizing anybody else's approach has no love in it. There's no love for the other people, allowing them to be themselves and do things in their way. Swamiji, once someone said that he was a leader in a community, some other person, uh, was a leader in one of our communities and he said to Swamiji, people are upset with us because we're not doing it, we're not doing this particular thing the way they want. We're not doing it in their way. 
And Swamiji said, of course you're not doing it in their way, you're doing it in your way. You see, we have to allow room for that because we don't see the whole picture. And so, on the other hand, I don't want to make it just seem arbitrary. We want to do it in Master's way, in Swamiji's way. And I think this person, this leader, was in alignment with that. Otherwise, Swamiji wouldn't have said that. He would have said, well, something else. So, all, again, the simplest way out of it is just find a way to smile. If there's no smile, your answer is probably wrong. Even if it's not wrong, it's wrong. It's a wrong attitude. And find more joy. And again, thinking won't get you there after a point. So chant, do other things to get out of the mind and into the heart. And then finally, when you find yourself too critical of the path, of one's, of ourselves, of anything like this, remember the love is, is getting choked. I won't say it's drying up or something too drastic, but it's getting suffocated a little bit. Get first into that place of love, that place of calmness. Then bring up the question again. You see, there was a friend of mine, she said she was having an argument with another friend and because the friend was refusing to take her advice and change this part of his personality and, uh, or this habit. And she said, do you accept that what I've suggested is a good thing? And he said, yes. And do you accept that it would be good for you to do? And he said, yes. And she said, then why don't you do it? And he said, it's not a priority for me right now. And she went, hmm. <laughs> You see, it, it's a good point. We do have to prioritize. There's, so many, so, there's only so many battles we can fight, so many fronts we can be on and say, absolutely, but just not now. I've got other things that I've got to finish up first. And in fact, those, conquering those battles will give you the strength to take on other challenges. Okay? So remember, live more in the heart, the calmly loving heart. God bless you. <laughs>